Hello, my friends. Oh, how are you guys today? Oh, sorry, it's like running over here. Um, got a bunch of got a bunch of great questions today. Get on with John in a moment. Hello, my friends. How are you guys doing? What's up, buddy? Ooh. Today's already a day. Already a day. How is, uh, how is that? It's when you, one of those days when you wake up to a phone call from an A&R that says, hey, we have to deliver this EP tonight, mastered and everything, and I'm still missing files for three songs to mix for the project. So you have three mixes to do for which you have no files. For which I have no files. One of which the producer says isn't even done. Um, and one of which has been emailed for. And the other one of which is in the ether of I'm not sure where it's coming from. So, so, to, so we, are you going to have to leave this live to go mix? Uh, I'm, I'm hoping not. Josh is over here taking care of some things. Right now, we're trying to match auto-tune settings. Um, for an artist that his only note is the auto tune doesn't sound right. I'm like, I didn't change it. It's committed. I don't know what to do. So he's take, taking care of that right now while we chat. So I'm just letting you know where my head's at, but yeah. it's something to talk about. So um, I'm, I'm happy to be here live in the moment <laughs> we'll of talk what about it's that. like to make records uh, in the 24th hour. <laughs> in the 24th hour in 2020 in a chaotic time when, yeah, yeah. That's, um, there was actually some people that they were asking questions. Uh, uh, th there seems like there's always a, always a few questions about how do you deal with stressful situations, difficult clients, people who are hearing things differently. And, uh, you know, it's, I think it's one of those things that there, there is no good answer. And just the more you do it, the more you learn how to do it. It's, it's part, part of a big part of our job, whether you're a, a mixer or a producer, uh, uh, unless you are the artist and the artist has their own stresses, you are on some level facilitating personalities filled with stress some large percentage of the time. And that yeah. really is the job. You know, I, we talk about this a lot where there are many, many people who have the raw skills to do any version of what we do. People with great voices, people who can write great lyrics, people who can mix things. Um, and it's really the demeanor, the practice, the, the focus, the psychology, the intent that really separates the people who have long careers. Yeah. I mean, there's no way, there's no um, reason for me to get stressed here in the moment. It's not going to do anybody any good because at yeah. the end of the day, the artist still wants it to be done tonight. Yeah. So I'm going to do my best to facilitate the completion of this project with the least friction as possible towards everyone involved. Um, it is hard, though. It is difficult to stay that way when someone is saying, hey, the auto-tune settings aren't right, and you're like, wait, I don't even have auto-tune up. It's I didn't do anything. Stem. Yeah. I didn't do anything. So that it is frustrating in a, in a degree, but you want it to be like the way, it, like, I want the vocal to sound like it did in the rough with auto-tune because it sounded right. And I yeah. hear what he's saying about it being different, but that's not on me, so I can't fix that. But I want it to be fixed, so I'm empathizing with the artist here, but also kind of have my hands tied. Uh, so there's really no point of becoming stressed and he doesn't seem stressed. And I just acknowledge that I can jump on a phone call after this uh, meeting I'm on for an hour, which is live with Matt Rad. Uh, <laughs> meeting, with, if, meeting with all of you watching. If this version isn't correct yet, uh, because it is, um, it does need to be delivered. So we do have to sort this. So, yeah, it's, uh, it, I like that you've said out loud several times now that there's no reason to be stressed because it's it's a total na totally natural thing to feel stress, feel other people's anxiety, feel other people's stress. And a big part of our yeah. job is to be the least stressful person in the process. I think that yeah. do, doing great work is probably the most important thing, but right up there is being easy to deal with being, you know, b being a conduit for other people's creative flow. And if you can be a person that is reliable, easy to deal with, if you can be easy to deal with, you're already 
uh, head and shoulders above the rest of the process for most people because the yes. process is just ripe with opinions and egos and all that kind of stuff. And if you can do great work while removing that part of the process, removing that stress, you, you're doing well. I know, yeah. I know you have many practices uh, for that. We talk about this sort of stuff. Yeah, funny, funny story. Same, same artist, um, same producers on, the, on a couple of the songs. And um, I, send, uh, I send a mix back and I did this like kind of wild, distorted uh, vocal move towards the end of the song where the artist was like really giving it his all and bursting at the seams. And I was trying to do this kind of punk rock uh, distortion move where like the, the distorted vocal out took the dry vocal and towards mm-hmm. the end of the song when there's no drums and it's big into reverb and this whole move, this whole like cinematic move that was clearly, I don't know, maybe it's not clearly, maybe there's no objective, but it was sick. And it's one of those few. It's one of those. It's one of those few times that you know you did something tight, and you're like, "They're gonna fucking dig this." And then I get the only text back, um, and I don't know who it was from because I didn't, I don't know the numbers in the group thread. Right, right, right. Uh, I've had that too. Uh, you know, it was like, "Yo, why is the vocal so distorted?" And I was like, "You just missed the whole reason for that. You didn't even ask what what's going on. Like, oh, I I hear what you did. I don't fuck with that though. Like." You didn't even meet me halfway. You didn't, and I was just like, all right, whatever. And no ego. So I just muted it and sent it back and we're good on it. It's getting mastered now. Yeah. But it was just like, you didn't meet me halfway. You didn't respect the mood. That was clearly intentional. It wasn't by accident. My, your vocal was distorted. It was a sick distortion. It sounded like a fucking fuzz box. And it was clearly a move, not a mistake. <laughs> it's like, that's, those are the times that, you know, on, the, on these calls with you, I talk about how I kind of quit producing. Yeah. Those are the times you wish you were producing the record because that was a tight move and your fans would have understood what those, that move was. But because it was different, you couldn't understand the improvement. You just heard, oh, it's now distorted and it wasn't. And that's, that's a, a topic that I'm still in my head about how to talk about that because it falls under the category of demoitis, but it's a really specific part of it. It's like, the, oh, it's different. I don't like it versus, oh, why is it different? Why do I not like it? Is there something here, though, that we can run with? And I bet if we were in the same room together, not over email or text, um, this move could have been made to some degree because it's sick. And it's not that it's bad without it. It's just it was cool with it. Yeah, and, and this is something that happens all the time. And, and it's, I think it's actually interesting for the anecdote to get the note on a group chat where you don't actually know who the note was from. You just know that whoever it was on there is part of the decision-making process. And that's a really important thing for people as they're coming up. You realize like you're going to have, you're going to get feedback from people who you might feel like they don't know what they're talking about. They're listening for the wrong things, but that's a part of the process is getting incomplete feedback from incomplete opinions and it, those are those things are difficult to navigate. Matt, Matt, I didn't even know that the artist was in the group thread until this morning. I didn't know the artist was one of the people in the group thread. What am I supposed to do with that? Yeah. It might have been him that said that note. Yeah. I don't even know. I Now I know he's in the thread. I don't even know which number is his. That's where I'm at. I'm like, huh? You know, there's a tendency also in the process to, and it's an, I think it's an important thing to do, but like many things, you don't want to go too far with it. It's important to understand who sort of holds the authority in the decision-making process, because sometimes yeah. things are um, very artist-driven, and the A&R person's kind of in the back trying to hold up their hand like, I like it too. Because they gotta, yep. you know, they gotta have yep. an opinion and do their job. Sometimes it's really A and R driven, and yep. they are incredible record makers. And the artist yep. is like, I really trust them. Sometimes yep. it's a straight pop act where the artist is just like, I already did my part. You guys tell yep. me when it's done. Um, it, it's hard to know. It, it's important to try to parse through that and understand, you know, who's really making the decisions, but also. And that can get you into trouble too if you try to go. Well, this person doesn't know what they're talking about, so I shouldn't listen to them. I mean, I, I've I've hit all ends of that spectrum, and it's a you know, there's no good answers for these things. It's right. just well, experience. Yeah, I have I have a couple of thoughts there because there's there's two different kinds of artists that work with. Uh, let's keep independent artists out, and we'll talk about major labels. So the, that that there would be an A and R involved. So when yeah. there's an A and R involved, we're just going to use that 
as a distinction for for conversation purposes. And I think there's the the history in the 90s and and earlier. I mean, it goes back to the 50s, like manufactured artists. If the label picks someone and run and says you're going to be this thing, and they're an entertainer, they're not really a true artist. They're they're a great well, it's, singer. It's and art. Not, you know, A and R is as, as if people don't know actually know the history. It's artist and repertoire. It's the person yeah. at the label who says. I've found the song, that's the repertoire, I'm going to place it with the artist, the yeah. producer will put together the session, the artist will come in and sing the way we tell them, yeah. and there's your record. Yeah, um, exactly. So that exists, and then there are now um, a lot more artists bringing something special to the table that the labels are, are signing them for distribution purposes, which is, mm-hmm. let's, get the, let's get these out here, we'll take a gigantic percentage from you to we'll do give so. give them a pile we'll, of money, and we'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, we'll market the fuck out of it, and we'll do our thing with it. So, those kind of artists, I, I tend to want to talk to the artists and the producer, because they clearly have the vision. And on the other side, you could tell when those kind of artists are, are the, um, the more manufactured artists that don't have as clear of a vision, both equally as important to the way that our business flows. Mm-hmm. I want to talk to the A and R on there. That's kind of middlemanning uh, the 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 conversation. This one clearly is an artist driven project. Uh, he got signed uh, based off of his own independent success. Had a, a record in the top top ten before mm-hmm. he was signed. Like th- this is clearly an artist driven uh, project. So I would have loved to be talking to him directly from the beginning, and I wasn't. And now in this twenty fourth hour, it's a little more difficult to. Uh, have that communication solid, uh, which I'm hoping after this I can maybe get on the call with him just to to align in the, for the for the last you know 12 hours that we have to deliver this. Yeah, um, just align and make sure we are. I mean, up till now, I mean, a, a single came out on Friday and it sounds dope, and we all like that one. So I just you know I want I want to stay aligned. But there are two different types of artists in this massive music industry that we talk about a lot. Um, and it's, and the, it's important to make the, distingu- uh, the distinction between the two in communication. Yeah, and, and uh, communication is the right word, I think, which is no matter who the decision maker is or who the decision makers are, you got to have a good line of communication with somebody in order to do your best work. I mean, I've, I've definitely had projects where people just tell me to do my thing and just send it directly to the one person and then it goes through the system. And I've had the thing where I've then the next time I hear from I'm doing a production and then the next thing I hear from them, like I'm finishing a production, the next time I hear from them, they send me mix revision 11 and they're like, we can't figure out why this isn't, is the, and I'm like, 11. I'm like, yes, well, if, Let me you'd, help involve, you. if you'd involve me yeah. from one, probably uh, would have done, done it two or three. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. But, but, but that's also, you know, I, I remember the first couple of times things like that happen. I get incredibly frustrated and stressed and why didn't you, ah, I yeah. didn't say that to them, but I yeah, felt that it, felt that in my heart. Um, yeah. But at a certain point, you 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 got to just kind of get over that stuff. And and I I just I really like that you you said out loud in the first few minutes like there's no reason for me to be stressed about it. There's no reason for yeah. me to be stressed because you know but, your natural thing is to feel because yes, you, you love your work, the, you're passionate about yes, it. Yes, and in your in what you just said in your defense is historically I felt that way. This is this is like a year or two old. This yes, feeling yes, yes. of it's exactly okay, what I'm saying, yeah. like. We're going to get it done. I, I, A&R called me. Clearly, she was still in bed when she called me. It was like 9.15 this morning. She's like, well, I just got a call from the boss uh, saying that this got to be delivered tonight. I was like, cool. I'm here. I'll clear my day. And I'm here all, all night. Whatever you need to get this done because I'm with you on the, on the importance of this project, too. Like, I love this artist. So I'm in. And it's right from the beginning, I, you got me. You got me for the day. Let's get this done. Now, I can't necessarily be held accountable for files not being delivered to me yet, yeah. but I'm going to do my best to reach out to the people in the process that I know that have access to files, which is how I found out that one wasn't done yet. <laughs> well, and, and, and I've been in that, that place a lot where you get the email or the text that's accusatory saying, you know, even if they don't say this is your fault, they say, why don't, have you started on the, why aren't you, and you just go back and you go, I don't have the files yet. I, I can reach out direct. If you want to link me to somebody, I'm happy to do it. Like just yeah. being in every aspect yes. of the stressful process, be the cool customer. And and I was thinking of, uh, as you were talking there, mm. those of us that are not artists, you have to remember that the artist, the producer to a lesser extent, but the artist, especially this is their whole career. Yes. For you, presumably it's one of, dozens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of recordings you'll make in your career. 
So you just have to remember and that, that yes, the, the extrapolation or the application of that applies to a lot of things, but you got to remember that you're going to go make a hundred more records and they'll make a few, most artists make a few albums. If they're really lucky, if they have a great career, a few albums, yeah. a couple of dozen singles, like yeah. It's a, you'll make so many more as a mixer, as a producer, as an engineer, I, you'll make always, so many more records. I always say that they have to live that record. I don't have to live it. So yeah. I want to make it so they love it the most. So when they live it, they're proud of it. And that's my job. And that's the, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I talk about that a lot. That's my, that's my favorite bit. That's how you really separate the ego. Cause it's not my record. Yeah. I love to put my my sensibilities and my taste into it when I'm allowed to and when I'm invited to. It's an honor to some degree a lot of the time too. Yeah. But it's I don't have to live it. I don't have to go perform it. Well, that's um, that's the that's the biggest part. You know, I, I'm actually um, today is day two of my first in person sessions at the new place. I saw you're uh, with Grayson. Got, with Grayson, yeah. And, I love uh, I love get, Grayson. Grayson's great. Um, get, like you know, getting COVID tests and all that stuff. Everything's everything's all healthy and up and up. Um, yeah we were talking yesterday about a lyric and it's something that to, to this point where we're trying to figure out, does this make more sense? Does this make more, more sense? And, you know, I can help make decisions in that process, but it, in the end, it's, if, if this is right, you're going to go sing this for a couple yes. of decades. You have to you're going to sing it. So, so it's, it's, it's what, what's going to feel the best yes. in your heart on stage that you're going to be proudest to sing. Um, that's ultimately what we're trying to do is facilitate yes. that process, that, that career process. Like us doing, you mixing one song is someone else's first single that if it all goes well, they perform that song with the same lyrics roughly for the next 40 years. Yes. So it should feel, and that, that recording will be everywhere. Like that's, yes. it's a really important way to remove one's own ego from want, the process. I want to, to, I want to, in, in, I want to inject something about that's, that's relevant to this, but also uh, an aside, someone mm. in the comments, uh, I, I don't want to call anybody out, so I'm not going to call their name out, but I was a little bit annoyed by the fact that I was just asked when we're talking about this, this is a really, this is the most important part of the process. And someone mm. said, any way to get tube warmth from software? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's just, we can, we're going to talk about those things yeah. too, but this is so much more important than the warmth from a tube or a piece of software. And it's just like, come on, someone's got to, got to, got to put a stop on those things. Like that's not the, that's not the importance of why we're on these every Tuesday discussing this. We're talking about making records. We can talk about warmth all we want, but no artist doesn't care about the warmth. They care about their vocal performance. You're, you're, on, we, fire today. you're on fire today. I love it. I mean, <laughs> no, no, I, look, I agree with you. It, I caught, think, it caught me off because we're having a yeah. conversation that is so meaningful to us because this is where we're at. This is the mo This is how you keep getting hired. Not, yeah, yeah. not exclusively for the warmth or brightness on your records. You know what yeah. I mean? That's why we're here. That's why we get to have these talks. And, and I feel lucky and privileged to be able to be at this level to talk to you about this. And I think it's my responsibility to to point out those moments of what, what are you, are you hearing what we're saying? Well, um, I would like to agree with you and also say, check out our full episode where we talk about yeah. harmonic distortion and saturation yeah, it's yeah. on the YouTube. Yeah. It's on my IGTV. We got some clips about it. So please check it out. Cause we've, we, we have, and we'll continue to talk about a lot of stuff. And, and, and I think also there's, you know, there's, uh, quite, quite a few people watching uh, sort of levels up every week, which is great. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, and uh, so, so there's new people that are kind of getting the vibe. I mean, we, we talk about this a lot. One of the reasons that you and I like to do this is because there's lots of great advice out there. There's lots of great ways to make your kick drum slap and all that kind of stuff. But I think these sort of conversations about the why and how you think about it and how you survive psychologically and the habits to build and what it means to be a record maker and how to relate to artists and other record makers. That's a thing that there aren't a lot of good instructions for. And that's why we want to do these as conversations so people can participate. So uh, yeah. we, we appreciate Agreed. you guys giving okay. feedback, okay. but ch check out our, check out our harmonic. Yeah. Th thanks, whole hour thanks, for that. Uh, <laughs> thanks for that. Thanks for that show. Subscribe host. to the YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> But, but my point of, of interjecting there about this yeah, was, yeah. look, you and I, you just said you were in with an artist first time in, in, 
since COVID hit. Yeah. I'm in I'm in it right now doing this record that has to be done today, still missing files for three songs. Oof. We're in it. So what people are getting from these conversations is real time feedback about making records. This isn't yeah. something we did 30 years ago. We're now talking about it. Yeah. I mean, one day you and I will hopefully be doing interviews or maybe, I don't know if hopefully is the right word, but we'll probably be doing interviews and discussing our process from 30 now years we're gonna ago. We're going to keep doing this. We're going to, yeah, yeah, exactly. But it'll be, this is real time. And yeah. I'm not getting I'm not getting hired today for my warmth. I'm getting hired for my ability to deliver a record, and really that's what's so point. that's the that's what I'm trying to get at by pointing out that faux pas in the in the in the in the thread. Because yeah, it's just yeah. like I don't I love the two warmth is now an extension of my process and my yeah. aesthetic and my taste. But that's not what's going to get me to the finish line here. It's just not. No gear, no plugin is going to get me to finish line on. Hey, why is my auto tune not sounding right? But it's committed to a stem. Like that's just those are those are those are mental um, bits that cannot be solved by a trick of the trade uh, from an interview or a conversation between two record makers. That's something that comes from practice, experience, focus, healthy diet, all of those things that we talk about to get yourself ready to handle this quote unquote stressful moment that I'm not going to allow to be stressful. Well, this is a, a, a the the meta. The meta comment that I have on all this is it's really interesting to see you exactly as you said, you're really in it right now. And it's, I think it's good for people to see someone like you who is such a pro. Oh, you're still with the Topo Chico. That's a whole other conversation. Oh, dude, I got six cases. I'm fully endorsed. Now. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, the, to see you in the process, someone who is uh, very professional, very mellow, but to, I can tell you're, you're in it right now. And there's, yeah. you know, that there's a lot going on today. And also, thank you, and on behalf of everybody watching, like, thank you for taking the time today. You know, I, I pushed. I was going to cancel. I thought about canceling yeah. when I got that call, and I was like, no, 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 we need to go. This is why we're doing this. Yes, we need to be on exactly. it in these moments. This is about. This isn't about you and I. This is about people actually understanding what it's like to make records. And granted, because of the artist, I can't like press play on something. I would love to bring that aspect into this yeah. too. I'd be like, yo, I'm working with so and so. Like, check this out. While Josh is over there, still working and delivering stuff to mastering, like. Let's let's talk about that in real time. I wish I can do that because I can yeah. easily just go, hey, studio's over there. But I, I, I just I'm not allowed, you know, to, to a certain degree. There's got to be privacy. Yep. But that's why we're here to talk about things like that. So I can, in the vaguest way possible, be as direct as possible with what's happening and what it's like to deliver in the final hour an EP or an album or a mixtape or a single or whatever it is. Yeah, dealing, dealing with the stresses. Uh, somebody asked in the chat. We were talking about major label artists. How is it different with independent artists? The only the, there are a few ways that it's different off the top of my head, but the fundamentals are all the same. You have people that are doing something that, if it goes well, is a thing that they're going to be working on for years and years. How to perform, how to promote. It's going to be their identity. There may be fewer decision makers. There may be less money. Sometimes that means less stress. Sometimes it means a whole lot more stress because everybody's different kind doing of favors. Stress. Different kind of stress. People yeah. are people are tiptoeing around each other because you because you're asking for favors, and that's if you're getting paid, you can have a different form of communication than if you're saying, "Hey, it would be really great if you could do this for me." You can't, yeah. you know. There's there's different stresses, but but by and large, it, it holds the same. That our job is to be the conduit, not the artist. Um, yes. doesn't mean we, we can't go have huge creative inputs, but, but your story of what you said, where you made a, you made a creative decision in the mix that you're like, this is objectively sick. And somebody just goes, Hey, it sounds distorted. Make that go away. You're like, fuck. <laughs> <sighs> it was so tight. It was so but yeah, tight. I just, I don't, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking about it in a, in a sense again, to tell the story, but I don't care. Yeah. This shit still sounds great. I yeah. ain't tripping on it. I'm not like, Oh, that's a missed opportunity completely. I think it's a missed opportunity to a degree for yeah. your fans to hear something bold like that, but his performance is still bold, so it's still there, right? And that's how you have to see these things. It's not, it's not like, oh, my idea didn't make it. It sucks now. It's like, mm, not really. It's still pretty good. And it, t tell me, uh, I mean, we've got a bunch of questions and stuff, but I, I, love, this. I love this topic. You yeah. said it's only been the last year or two where you feel like you've been able to release some of that how would you describe it? You're you're getting caught up in stress, anxiety, or ego, or what's? How, how do those things? Both. Yeah. Both. The it's something ego. I always I mean, struggle all... with. I still struggle. Also, I'm I'm in there like trying to write emotional lyrics every day when I'm writing, and so there's a different kind of involvement. But 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 it's still like I feel I still yeah. feel it all the time. 
I mean, those two things are intertwined, the, yeah. the ego and, and, and stress. I mean, if you r- relax your ego, by default, you'll probably relax your anxiety and stress. I mean, the, the anxiety is tied up in, in the ego. Mm. Um, so, right, that's the, that's the main goal. So I actually don't think you can hang on to one without the other. Yeah. Uh, so if you separate your ego from the, the present and what actually matters, this, what are you holding on to then? What stress are you actually holding on to? Um, because if I say, I've never really thought about this, so let's just try it. Well, if I'm yeah. saying I'm, I'm holding on to that move that I made, that's I'm holding on to my ego because I made the move. And you liked it. It was your decision. Yeah, it, it, and it represents some part of your creative being. And if I choose, exactly. And I, if I choose to be stressed because that didn't make it, I'm choosing to be stressed and holding on to the anxiety and stress due to ego. I don't like, what's the utility there? Cause yeah. the record's still going to come out without your move on it. And I want to, I'm going to be precious against it. It doesn't make any sense. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me. It, it makes sense to someone that thinks that way. Like yeah. I used to, and like you're saying, sometimes you still do. And I, I don't even think I still do anymore. Mm-hmm. Even just being real on like, ah, I just kind of go, okay, um, what am I going to eat for dinner tonight? Yeah. And that's going to be the way I control that. I control what I cook. If I'm cooking for myself, cooking for my girl, or cooking for uh, for friends, like I get to now express myself that way. So I've found other ways to express myself than having to make bold, creative moves in a mix when they're not warranted. And I get to do them a fair amount of times. So it's not like it's a a zero percent time that I don't like. I don't do anything creative. I think my aesthetic and my approach is creative. So. Yeah. If I get away with my approach to a mix, that's enough for me. So, yeah. but the practice is sitting with it and going, see again, where do you high pass your mix bus? Are you, are you, sorry, I'm just like, come on. Stay with your train of thought. Don't get, you got this. But you know what I mean. I know what you mean. Which is like, sorry, you're right. Well, there was, a, there was a, there was a great, um, there was a great question this week that relates to this. And I just wanted to give a shout out because it was such a good question. Um, I don't high pass my mix bus. Just so everybody knows. everybody knows. Everybody knows. I don't. That. I don't do it. I don't ever. Either. I never high pass my mix bus. <laughs> just, just turn down the sub bass if it's too loud, bro. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, where was it? What was the question? Um, oh, Jamie asked how is important. How important is it to have hobbies outside of your career? And and there's a. Um, I love people shouting out other episodes to check oh, out. That's great. Absolutely. Um, this idea of having antidotes counterbalance other creative outlets i think is hugely important i think it's one of the most underrated parts of making records and you know some people it's they're an artist and they're a recording artist but also they'll paint on the side or they'll whatever like have some other creative thing photography photography i think the the idea of having antidotes to what we do because you're going to be in a position especially as a record maker but as an artist you're the music business you got to remember that those are two words that sort of contradict like art art business the idea of pure creativity and then commerce the collision of art and commerce is a chaotic thing that on some level is Mm. i think my brain has been trying to negotiate that since i was a kid and that's why i became a producer because i like helping people figure out who are making pure art and then also having an entrepreneurial thing and how those interrelate is just fascinating to me. But anytime you're making music and it involves money, you are necessarily going to compromise something. Um, Mm. And that may mean you're not doing the whole thing yourself. You're just compromising the identity of it because you're collaborating with someone. Compromise doesn't mean a bad thing. It's that's part of collaboration is allowing other people to have input and you may build greater things because of it. But it's an incomplete form of pure creativity. So I think it's always worth finding other outlets that allow you complete freedom. And even if that's, you like running, you like jogging in the morning, or you like painting, or you like reading about physics, or you, whatever it is, you do need things that are outside of what we do because it gets stressful and it gets weird. And you, you know, you, you do something that you think is brilliant, whether it's a distortion move on a vocal or you write the best song and everybody goes, this sucks. Pause, pause. Go. Let's, uh, let's, let's, t- let's um, take out the word brilliant, right? Okay. The minute you say that I did something that was brilliant, you might as well just get slapped in the face. Unless you're Kanye West. What do you, like, even then, like, let's I, just I don't I, know. go, but I don't know if e- I agree with this. You can deem 
what you did was brilliant, that's for other people to decide. I think you that's true. I made a brilliant move. That joke was brilliant that I made. I mean, let's just let's talking jo- about joke, ridding joke, yourself. Joke is uh, or separating the side. No, deeming okay, that your your own go. joke is brilliant. Come on, your no, own I'm words. Saying, I'm saying that that I'm here's here's how maybe brilliant's not the right word. I think it's worth being very like delusionally excited about creative things that you're doing to then hold on to that and not allow other people to have a response to it is the part where you can get in trouble. But yeah. I think you have to, in the moment, like I've probably written 500 songs where in the moment I'm like, this is the most incredible thing I've ever done. And then the next day, how do you, how do you know? You, well, you don't, but you, I think there's some, maybe this is more on sort of like the artist writer, but you, you I know you, you've also, no, I'm caught talking about it philosophically, not from any uh, any part of the music industry's uh, creative process. I'm I'm talking about emotionally. I think it's valuable to be so delusionally excited about something where you don't worry about what the rest of the world thinks in that moment. Totally, but so why I think that's do, so that's what I'm that's what I'm agreed, getting at. But, but it, and, and if you're going to do that, you are inevitably going to be disappointed by the reality that you yes, and you can later do that without. Or, you can do that without categorizing it or identifying it as a word like brilliant, sure, okay. or exceptional, or visionary. And re- referring to yourself as said titles. Absolutely, absolutely. And it still can be the case. But yeah, let's, yeah. let's, I just wanted to point out that word, but let's jump back to your, the, the hobby yeah. question because what you're saying up until that point was, was really resonating. And I just needed to point that out because it's a trigger word for me. Like to say that you're, what you did was brilliant uh, uh, causes yeah. your brain to hold on to that even further. And yeah. you wouldn't be able to let go of that move like I explained well, earlier. It's, an, like it's if, an interesting balance too because it, especially as, as artists, you're going to believe it's it, maybe it's maybe it's more like belief because you're going to believe before everybody else believes you're going to believe that you have the ability to do something or that what you're doing not can necessarily com- can compete well i, I think as, a lot of people you have to i mean but as a as a painter maybe your agent or manager believes in the piece m- more more or a designer believes in your piece more than you and then you come around to understanding why it could connect with all different types of people that could be that, true too yeah um Hold on, let's jump back to, to okay. hobbies for a second. Getting this lost in the go, weeds. This can go really deep. I mean, it's great. It's really, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love I love it. But um, uh, Spider spider put into the, uh, the thread um, ways to stay human, right? And then um, that made me think of uh, my friend Dallas K, who I think you, you know Dallas as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, songwriter, producer, he's amazing. Um, he p- did something on Instagram yesterday. It was a, a poll and it was a you know work to live or live to work and he he showed that the music industry friends the majority of them put uh live to work mm. and i was just like wait that's kind of sad i mean i'm guilty of that probably up until this year so i can see both sides of it i think i did live to work because i don't feel like making music is work i feel really privileged and lucky to get to make art for a living. I still hold that perspective every day. Yeah. But at the same time, we work so we can do things and live. Yeah. Like I work so I can eat good meals and be generous with my income and take friends and my girlfriend out to dinner and to go on trips. I'm going um, up north for the weekend uh, on Friday to Sunday with Niku and just going to go away for a couple of days. Like I'm learning this now at 34 um Mm. soon to be 35 like i don't know about the live to work uh reaction in um in creative fields it just it seems backwards even though it makes sense fundamentally like we love what we do but is that why we do it to keep doing it or do we do it to keep doing it to also live i think those those two i don't want to not do what i do Uh, i don't want people to think that that's what i'm talking like stop doing what you love it, there's just got to be a different way to communicate this. I think those those that little flip of phrase is a little is 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 too simple to really w- without really defining what those things mean. I mean, you know, I, I may have said this on the stream. I said this to somebody earlier. I remember when I was dating somebody like ten years ago, and it was a Sunday, and she texted me, "What do you What are you doing?" It was Sunday afternoon. I was like, "Um, oh, I'm, I'm at the studio." Um, She's like, what are you working on? I was like, oh, I'm just doing some. She's like, why are you at work on a Sunday? And I said, well, I mean, I, I, 
I, was, I thought about it. I was like, I sort of felt like I was being accused of doing something crazy yeah. or like, and I was like, well, I had brunch with my friends and like, I called my mom and I went on a run. Right, right, right. And, and I was like, I worked my whole life to get to the point where I'd have a cool studio and a hundred year old piano. This yeah. is what I did on my free, this is what I did in my free time <laughs> yeah. well before I made any money. This is what I love doing. I love, um, yeah. So on some level, I, all I want to do is work but in that sense, it wasn't work because I wasn't getting paid. But everything I do as a creative person could, I, I might get paid off at some point. You know, the majority of songs I write, I don't get paid off of, but I still love the process so much. So I don't know. That's, that's a hard, that's a hard phrase to, yeah. to try yeah, to yeah, flip. Yeah. I mean, but, for, for, for me, most of the time, it doesn't feel like work. So yeah. I relate to that question, but I don't think I live to work. I think I live to create. Yeah. Um, but I, I would I would try to think about work slightly different for those people that are not necessarily in the same place, like people maybe that don't make music that are watching this or hearing about this and um, someone that's just tuning in. I, I, we have to balance the two. But yeah, it's a little bit unrelatable to people that don't create for a living to understand why you'd be in the stu- happily in the studio on a Sunday. Um, I, I Yeah. I mean, I like it, work. Well, it's, it, yeah. it gets it gets a bit to to what we were talking about before about hobbies. Like to have things outside of what we do, it's just really important because at various points when you when you do things that are purely creative or you're really excited about something and it gets rejected by the commerce aspect of it, you got to have other things to go to to make yourself feel happy. I remember reading an interview with um, I can't remember the the woman's name, but it's she goes by Bat for Lashes, and she yeah, was I love talking. Bat for lashes. She was talking about having crazy writer's block and, and talking, uh, and talking to her friend, Tom York. And she's like, what do I do? I got writer's block. He's like, go, go paint, go do something else. Create it. Go. Yeah. And, and she said, as soon as she went and did something with no consequences, no pressure, it opened her up. There's a, there's an exercise that I like to do periodically. And I recommended it to other artists and I got it from, I think from, uh, both from Sean Harris, uh, from the matches and maniac and other, other creative projects and from uh, Sarah Watkins of, um, of Nickel Creek and, and, and solo stuff as well, doing this exercise of writing a song a day for 30 days. With right. The idea being the only goal is to finish a song and actually on some level, don't try to make something good. So you're just in the habit of doing creative output without consequences. Yeah, you're so exercising you going, the muscle. As I, I need this to be great. I need this song to be a hit or I need the, if you start doing that, it just, it, a lot of times that just pulls you away from the pure creativity. So finding ways either through tricking yourself, little hacks, or finding other hobbies to get your creative brain moving without consequences is a really important thing. I, well, I, that's, I do versions yeah, of that all the time. That's so important to, to bring up because that's the, that's the problem with, or one of the problems with um, LA songwriter scene bouncing in three and four sessions a day sometimes is, you, the pressure of you having to do your best work every time, it's impossible. It's impossible. I mean, we've talked about this in earlier episodes about repeating lyrics and then maybe one or two songs will come out with that, with that on it because you've repeated it and a different producer takes that and runs with it. I mean, there are so many opportunities like that, but what it really doesn't do is it doesn't exercise the muscle that says just do something because yeah. there's so much pressure on you to create your best thing every yeah. day. And what if you don't know the person that could be that you're going to collab with, that could be a great thing and spark new creativity because it's with a new person or it could be the opposite where you don't feel comfortable with this person. The vibe's not right. So that's a, that's a thing that that's really important to touch on. I don't, I don't hear it discussed too often. Yeah. The, the pressure to be great is really high and it turns out the, I got to go read this part of the Steve Martin book, but he talks about, how much harder it is to be consistently good than to have moments of greatness to do something consistently well you will have the great moments will come out of that but you just got to kind of get in the mode of doing it but are you seeing this this comment in here uh i'm not i'm not i'm not worried about it you're not <laughs> touching it all right no. let's, let's move it. on from it okay I'll, I'll, it. I'll dm them okay um what but um but we we have lots of good technical discussions on here so people can people can uh People can check that out. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. there have been a few questions. Um, you know, we've been talking about doing more single topic um, hours, and yeah. I think and I think next week we should talk about business because um, there's a lot of questions about how do I get paid? What does it mean to have front end, back end, how taxes, expenses, that sort of stuff. So um, I, it seems like enough people are asking some questions about that, and it's hard to 
it's hard to ask or to tackle a specific question without explaining a lot of context. So maybe next week um, you guys can send in questions and we'll just talk about business. Maybe our arc. I mean, you know, there's some things we obviously it, it's harder to talk about with specific fees and specific budgets, but I think it's, it'll be pretty good to talk yeah. about because you and I have worked in so many different capacities um, I managed a band for a while. I used to put on shows. There's a lot of a lot of different ways to talk about this stuff. Um, so I think business stuff would be would be a good thing to talk about. Um, if you guys have other ideas on on full hour conversations, that would be good to. We can touch on it. You might know more. We can touch on it to a degree. I'm comfortable to a degree, but yeah. I have a manager for that purpose, so yeah. I don't. Um, well, you can mm, you can give some thoughts on it, and I you, I know I'm you have an good accountant, and I have like yeah. there's well, a reason. But I think I think that sort of stuff is actually what people are curious about because got it. You know, yeah. and and you know it's like we'll talk about how when I started I was doing it this way and uh, why do you add certain business people? What is a manager supposed to do for you? When did you when you know do you have a business manager? How do these things work? And I you know we can talk. There'll obviously be some private things and maybe you and I can discuss before how much we want to yeah. talk about our specifics. But uh, yeah. you know I've worked with so many different people that I think it's worth. Um, who have different business structures and all that kind of stuff. So I, I think it'd be worth talking about that. Maybe maybe you and I can wrap this weekend or something, but you guys can start sending questions about that because I know there's been some good ones. Um, one, of the, one of the things which we haven't really gotten into, and I think the, couple, the one or two times I've mentioned it, you said it's probably a, a fairly short conversation. There's lots of questions about mastering. Um, I don't know if it's worth trying to do a whole hour about it or just talk about it a little bit. Um, but I think it's because it's a question that a lot of people have, what do I expect from mastering? How do I prep things for mastering? What is mastering? Like what, what, what are they actually doing? Why is John so good? <laughs> yeah, um, that's, that's, that's a good question. Thanks, Elmer. Um, yeah. So I'm mastering yeah. stuff. You, you have, I, I a, just want, I mean, go get a mastering engineer on here to talk about mastering. I'll yeah. come on with you. We just like, can we do a three way? Can we just get Dale in on this conversation? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure we can figure it out. Um, just like, Cause I, I think mastering is super important and it's hard for me to articulate why I feel that way. I feel that way. Really? We can talk about this today. Like, yeah, to maybe a degree, we'll just talk about I, it for like 15 minutes now. Yeah, I don't then, have an hour worth to discuss. Yeah. But I, I think that it's important. Um, and I think of it, I think differently than a label thinks about mastering or a producer thinks about mastering. Okay, I think about okay. it from a very specific point of view where the mixer has a relationship with a mastering engineer and they know what they can get out of that engineer and they know where they're going to leave the mix off for that mastering engineer to do certain things. That was historically the way it was when it came to how much headroom you were leaving. So there was creative freedom on the mastering side to have 6 dB of headroom to do said work. Um, and now that's not as much. I mean, I deliver uh, my masters at, at zero, um, peak at zero, and uh, RMS or LUFS, uh, sorry, at uh, like minus 10, minus nine to minus 12, depending on the genre and how the rough mix was. So we've talked about numbers earlier on. Let's leave those numbers out from here on out. But I want my mastering collaborator to finalize it with me before anybody else hears it because we know if, okay, oh, this is so hard to describe. It's all good. I mean, I think it's if, worth go, trying. If a yeah. mix has been approved, the mastering should not be very heavy handed, yeah. right? So we need to preserve what was approved. Say there's four, seven versions of the mix getting really nitpicky on a couple of things, specifically in the low end or vocal level. Um, I, I, I think that we're, we're putting too much up for grabs if we allow um, the mastering engineer to uh, wildly do broad strokes because we're over the broad stroke, um, uh, you know, back and forth at that point. We're really nitpicky. So a, a good mastering engineer at this point, working within uh, headroom parameters that are, are, are pretty tight and minimal the majority of the time, have to be sensitive to that. And I don't think all are. Yeah. Um, Definitely not to the way I mix, which uh, Dale Becker, my mastering engineer and, and great friend, refers to as big transients. Uh, we talk about transients a lot early on. I mix with, with a lot of transients, so things jump out of the speakers. A lot of engineers, a lot of mixers compress out those transients, so there's a bit more of a wall, and, 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 and the, the transients aren't poking out. It's more controlled uh, to a yeah. degree. 
So I'm looking for different things out of a mastering engineer that I think all mixers are looking for different things, right? So when I think about it, I think it's my call. I think it's the engineer's call, not me, me, just the general me. It's the mixer's call. Now, I think broad strokes are welcomed when it's a project and we need to make songs sound cohesive, uh, whether that's an EP, an A side, B side on a single, uh, a whole mixtape, a whole album. I think you're going to have to match level and you're going to have to do broader EQ moves throughout. Now, granted, if I'm mixing a whole record or another engineer um, peer is mixing a whole record, we're doing that to a degree, but there's different producers and, you know, it's, it's hard to make a very cohesive project. It's very rare, uh, yeah. but that's the, that's the goal at all, at all times, uh, musically, to make a, a, a sound project from start to finish that the fan can enjoy and be like, oh, that's cool. Now, if it's meant to be all over the place and it's like, well, we're going to do a concept album of the, fo- the, the winter, the fall, the summer, and the spring, and they're going to all right. sound like this, the winter is going to sound dark and blah, blah. You know what I mean? Um, you can have a concept record, but still there has to be a thread line through it. And that's probably like the vocal performance or uh, sorry, the vocal sound. Maybe some of the songs have more wet reverb effects, but still it's a similar uh, style, right? So the mastering engineer is supposed to r- retain that alignment. And in fact, sometimes create that alignment uh, throughout the record, depending on how off the mixes are in, in level and EQ. So I think it's I- insane not to get your album or your EP mastered, but thinking bigger picture about your single, it's nice to have that last refined ear, that, that's, that mastery ear. I mean, a mastering yeah. engineer should be so refined in the moves that they make. And, and that's their practice. Their practice is I only have left and right I don't have 3,000 stems, 300 stems. That was an exaggeration. 3,000 stems. I'm not That's making a, a movie. Um, they, they, have, they have to refine what, what's the, the optimal way this is going to translate on multiple spaces, uh, DSPs, platforms. Um, I think it's so important to think that way. Uh, yeah, I love that, that broad strokes. That's a great example of Nathan Dantzler on slow hands. Totally agree. I know Nathan very well, and I was, I, 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 I've heard both the mix and the master. That is one example for sure, but thousands of songs get made a day that don't require that treatment. So that is an example. And I think they should run with that version. I also know that Nathan sent two versions of that master. Mm-hmm. That was that one. And then let the producer who he has a relationship with of about two decades decide which is the best. So that's relationship. So that example itself is a little bit, um, out of the, the normal context and it fits into the context I'm discussing of having a relationship as a mixer with your mastering engineer, because I would expect Dale to say, Hey, I'm feeling like it should sound like this, but before the artist and the label and everyone else hears it, what do you think about this direction? And that's kind of what I'm getting at is the relationship aspect of mastering is more important than the success level of said mastering engineer and their accolades. Um, because I don't, I, I don't know. Um, and Dale can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not sure how much in the process, like let's just say percentage wise, like there's an artist that creates a hit. Um, The producer also creates hits and can help. There's sometimes co-artists on a song. The mixer can shape a song to sound more like a hit that isn't sometimes. And then the mastering engineer, I'm not sure they have, they have the, the, the opportunity to make something more of a hit. Uh, and if they do, it's it's less than 5% of the time, mixer maybe 10 to 20% of the time, producer 50 to 70% of the time, and the artist 100% of the time, that they have access to whether it being a hit or not because they're writing and performing the song. So there's a percentage, and I think the mastering engineer falls less on that percentage. Um, and I would love a mastering engineer to argue that point of view uh, yeah. with me because I'd like to learn from that. But I think that's why... Um, the relationship is so key and important where together as a team, we, the mastering engineer and the mix engineer, because the mixer still has a chance to open the session back up and tweak things accordingly. If the mastering engineer feels that they need more room in some degree that we can affect um, the song or the record to make it a hit m- more than 10% as a team together. Uh, does that make any sense? That was a rant. Yeah. The, the, the percentage thing is, is sort of tough because now we're talking about like hits and what makes a hit and that sort of thing. But I, I, it seems to me that a mastering engineer in the way that we talked about as a mixer or as a producer, you're going to do dozens, hundreds, thousands of songs over your career. The mastering engineer is going to do tens of thousands of songs. So they're, 
their amount of time they spend on it is smaller, but th- their perspective is greater. Um, yes. And so, you know, the what a mastering engineer ultimately is, is like the last set of highly refined ears who mostly, most of the time, ideally, won't do that much, but has a, a wealth of experience and some tools at their disposal and a whole lot of perspective that, can, whole catch, lot. that can catch things you might... Not, they're sort of like an expert filter that yes. will will be will do minimal things, but occasionally do slightly larger things or give some feedback and say, "Hey, send this back to me, but give me a little less of this or a little more of this because I think it might achieve what you're trying to achieve." They have a perspective yes. that yes. we as producers, as mixers, may not have in the same way. It's a it's a refinement part of the process that isn't supposed to do very much but catch a whole lot of things that, that we may be missing. And that's why the relationship is so important. I mean, I've had so many records mastered by whoever the mastering engineer is on the project. And it's always kind of like, they just did what they did and I don't have control over it. Yeah. It's wild to me, man. What you ultimately want to do. And it gets back to what we're talking about the very beginning about communication. You want to have an open line of communication with everybody in the process from the people before the process coming to you, the people after the process that you're going to deliver things to wherever you are in that process, whether you're a songwriter or a mix engineer, there are people coming beforehand and there are people you're delivering to afterward. And to be the person that flows the best, um, uh, like we're talking about the people who are the best at, at our job are the ones that are the easiest conduit that add what they add, but it's smooth in the receiving end and it's smooth in the delivery end. You need to have yeah. good communication with both ends. And the mastering engineer is the last person on the sonic, uh, end of the process. So to the, the goal ultimately is exactly what you're talking about. You want to have a relationship with someone who you have great communication with, who can understand your tendencies, who can understand, having listened to tens of thousands of records in their same room that they've worked on, it's really just like the last bit of refining in the process. Huge point. Huge point. Mastering. Yeah, trust. Yeah, that's all I really got. Um, I think it'd be worth having Dale on, though, and and discussing things like this. And uh, I think a lot of people would get um, uh, huge benefits from hearing Dale talk about what he does, because he's our age, um, I mean, he's right between you and my age and he's just like, he's so in it. He's in it to, to be the best mastering guy in the world. And, um, it, it just, he talks about it differently and he, he understands the, the headroom changes and the future and the way that it actually will translate on different, uh, platforms. And he knows it by the number too. He's well studied and things like that are really important. Mm-hmm. Um, for someone like me, who's also a bit by the numbers and, and mathematical in my head and scientific in my head, that I want to, I want to know, I want to know that to a degree, and then and then be creative within those parameters and understand that. Um, so I, I think it'd be great to have him on. Um, I wonder if uh, we should talk about this. Maybe we can do it like this, or maybe we can get tested and do a do a conversations three hours of three hours of just on mastering. And, oh, and, nice. and zoom it and get people to ask questions, that sort of thing. Because I also feel like it would be cool to to go through a lot of specifics on that. Yeah. Um, that, that might cool. take some time. Um, okay, we got like, by the way, any updates? When, when, uh, when, what's going on with the conversation stuff? I know a lot of people on here are, um, yeah. are, are, are uh, following, following your stuff. Where, where are you guys? Oh, at with uh, we have our, we have our admin meeting on Wednesday, tomorrow night to upload. Uh, I think the first four or six we're, we're deciding. Nice. Um, we actually uploaded last week, but apparently on Lisbon, there was some confusion with Apple podcast. So it didn't go up there. It's just like, it's yeah. a, you know, learning another platform. It's just not our world. And, um, we're I went it through it. I went so. through it. It's it, it. And anytime you're like, cool, we're ready now. Then it's like, cool. We got six weeks before we can approve you. It's like, ah. <laughs> yeah. So we tried last week, but our goal, uh, cause Michael goes out of town on Friday for the rest of the year is to uh-huh. upload and then know how to upload weekly from there. So our, I think our plan, I'm allowed to say this out loud. I think we're dropping at least four ASAP and then we'll, we have 13 in the can. So we'll put weekly out for the rest of the year and, and, and keep going once a week, I think is our plan. Nice. Nice. So I'm let's so stoked if, about, let's see if there's any, um, yeah, those will be great, man. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, Let's see if there's any sort of quick uh, shout quick out things. Dylan for sure. Dylan there was, produce him. Nice, nice. Um, okay, really quick 
uh, uh, Alex asked, Alexander asked, uh, dynamic EQ and transients. Um, do you, you know, we, we talk about compression killing transients. Does dynamic EQ, which is a, you know, version of, uh, a version of multiband compression, does that mess with transients in the same way? Is it, are you, because it's frequency specific, it's not as damaging? What's, talk about, talk about that a little bit. I think it's less, way less damaging because it's frequency specific and you can get really narrow with it. But uh, as I talk about a lot in earlier episodes, I'm really big into transient makeup post all of these moves. Yeah. So um, I just fix it after that if I notice anything going away. But again, back to last week and the week before, don't use any, anything in linear phase uh, mm-hmm. mode for this because you will lose transients, especially in the bottom end. Um, and you'll get a smearing smudge effect um, from that. So, uh, no, I use dynamic EQ because I notice it uh, reducing transients less, and I'm way more specific. It's not very broad, wide Q moves. Most of the time, it's really specific, quite narrow, maybe mid to na- mid narrow to narrow moves. So con- um, conceptually, again, when we talk about when you when you put a compressor on, you are sacrificing some transients. If you put a dynamic EQ on because they're much more, instead of uh, compressing the whole frequency range, you're compressing a narrow band, it's not going to affect the transients and other parts of the frequency yeah. band. And, and of course will... it will. I mean, if you EQ a sound that has transients in the range that the transients are most prevalent, the phase going relationship to affect... will, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that, but that aside, like let's yeah. just say you have a snare drum and you put an analyzer on and the snare drum is hitting at 4K and you don't want as much 4K in your ear because it hurts and you reduce 4k you're reducing the transient because you can see that peak is where the transient is my thought on that and i do it regularly is pitch down the snare drum and hear what it sounds like where it's hitting lower maybe it's hitting at 2k and it's less obtrusive to the ear Mm -hmm. where the vocal is sitting right uh if you want to eq out 4k and then add transient back in you're basically re-adding the transient back in uh at that 4k in by reboosting the transient so what you want to do is saturate and warm up that area, control that area like a dynamic EQ, and then maybe saturate before or after that and shape that sound so that 4K doesn't hurt as much, but also is still there in its transient. So it's complicated, and it's, that those are not um, easy moves to make. Yeah. But you want to maintain transient, but also EQ those peaks out. But you have to, yes, you will lose transient with any EQ move, dynamic or otherwise. Um, What's the best pitch tool for that move? I just pitched on Polyphonic or Xform and Pro Tools, but I'm sure there are others. Uh, Ableton, put your sesh, your stem into Ableton. Sounds good. Pitch down. Do, uh, do the one that sounds the best. Yeah, do the one that sounds the best. <laughs> I've tried all different ones. Alter Boy, little Alter Boy sounds tight, yeah. uh, but it sounds artifacty and, and intentionally, and it's it's a vibe. So that's cool for some things. It makes it a little warblier. Um, I, I definitely encourage people to watch the whole hour we did on saturation harmonics. Um, the idea that if you have something that has a very narrow peaking transient that's annoying, instead of just turning it down, if you saturate it, you're actually expanding the harmonic content. Yes. So it's controlled, but it's thicker. And how much yes. you do that will, you know, and, and you can add, you can sort of, uh, you can squish it by using and thicken it by using some sort of harmonic saturation and then add transient back. You got, different things start happening when you, um, when you, when you add, uh, when you exactly. add harmonic saturation. Um, yeah. Because with that, with that, if that peak being so narrow is what's hurting your ear or hitting the threshold in the ear that's saying, ow, if you round that off just the subtle amount and make it wider, it feels different. It's more apparent yeah. to your ear and less pointy. So there are tricks to do that kind of stuff. Um, while keeping those transients there and you're just making them wider. I like that, that, that vision of what Matt just said. That's really important to think that way. Um, let's see. I think uh, that's all we got. I think we have a minute we got. left. We got a minute left. Um, it hasn't given me the two minute counter yet. So oh. Caleb, Caleb asks recommend recommendations on books, podcasts that you and I listen to. Um, I, I think, uh, all, all that stuff is very specific to your own taste. I've actually been listening to a lot less, uh, a lot fewer podcasts, a lot less podcasts overall, because everything has gotten so political. That's actually one of the things I love about these is we don't talk about politics. We just talk about music yep. and creativity. And I th- it sounds like other people are enjoying that too. I've gotten that feedback. So I've listened I, to a lot fewer podcasts than I used to. I would just, everybody should listen to Naval on Tim Ferriss's most recent I really like that podcast. One. I really like that one a lot. That's just like, go listen to that. Listen to it twice. Yeah. Um, go, go, just go once. listen to a bunch of Naval stuff. I think. Yeah. 
you know, the majority that's the of the things. Answer. Yeah, find, find Naval. That's that's there's there's the answer for books, podcasts right now. Go go check out what Naval is talking about in terms of happiness and tranquility, and yeah. and you know he has this great Twitter thread called that that he admits is is fairly clickbaity, but how to get yeah, rich without getting lucky. But it yeah. really talks about how to think about uh, relationships and and compound relationships and how to how to do things ethically and how to think about business while maintaining your sanity and happiness. And now he's doing a lot more about happiness and meditation. For those that are wondering, I've been somewhat cryptically doing a little, uh, yeah, like I was going to ask you what day. that is. I'm back to our meditation a day. Oh, nice. Um, so I'm, I, I did 15 days up until whenever it was when, when, when all the political stuff went crazy in the middle of the summer and I, and I got off of it, but, uh, I'm, I'm back on doing an hour every morning and I'm going to do 60 days and that's a Naval prescription. Yeah. So NAVAL. But, he, but uh, let's, let's just point out that, uh, he's not saying meditate 60 minutes a day for just 60 go- days. Google him. Doing and nothing. Doing nothing. He's saying do nothing. Cause I should just doing nothing. Cause yeah. if you're sitting there thinking you're supposed to meditate, then you're not actually getting the practice, which is anything can come to mind. Just don't do anything about it. Don't pick up your phone. Don't pick up a book. Don't watch something. That's different than meditating. He said that was one of three practices that he does. And I thought that was a key. So I'm doing that too, where I'm just sitting on the couch and I don't mind thinking about things, but it's not meditating per se. You're not like eyes closed, focus on your breaths and all of that, like kind of new agey way to think about mindfulness. But I, I just encourage people just just Google Naval on meditation. There's uh, yeah. there's a, a tweet thread. By the way, it's not giving me the two minutes, and maybe maybe I mean we'll stop now because that I know you got yeah, stuff to do. Yeah, I got to jump but anyway. It, but it seems like lives may may go on longer than an hour. We'll have to discuss whether we want to do that or keep it. On, I mean, it's one on one. I'd be, down, noon, I'd be so. down with things that are, are allowed to do that uh, when I have the freedom to do that. I can't do that today, but yeah, sure. I would love a ninety minute or with you. Well, thank you guys as always. Thank you, John. Yeah, Naval on meditation. N A V A L. Exactly, exactly correct. Um, hit us up. We're going to talk about business next week. So, any questions you guys have about anything, and we'll we'll do our best to to answer it. Um, please subscribe. Do the YouTube, all that stuff. We love. I love that you guys are sharing this stuff. It's uh, we really appreciate it. Really, just trying to provide value. Um, so, thank you guys for checking it out. John, love you. Good luck on your mixes love today. You. I hope you get all those files. Thank you. Me too. All right, guys. Have a good day. Cheers. Peace.